Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Before we get started, I want to invite you to come to Unwind, a free drop-in practice session that I'm leading each week on Zoom. It lasts about 30 minutes and just long enough, hopefully, to fit between all your other tasks and to-dos. Each week, I give a brief science-backed tip to help with stress management or well-being enhancement. Then we spend about 15 minutes in a guided relaxation, meditation, or contemplation practice. Lastly, we end with a few minutes for discussion and personal connection. I encourage people to make the session work for themselves, so if you prefer to call in or keep your camera off, that is just fine. You can get more details and sign up to get the Zoom link and call-in information at drkateking.com slash unwind. Hope to see you there. Hello, I'm Dr. Katherine King. And I'm Alex Gukja. In this episode, we talk to Dr. Sarah Bowen about her work developing the Mindfulness-Based Relapse Prevention Program for Recovering from Addiction and Addictive Behaviors. Dr. Sarah Bowen is a licensed clinical psychologist, an assistant professor at Pacific University, and an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. She received her doctoral training under the mentorship of Dr. Alan Marlat, and her research focuses primarily on mindfulness-based therapies for relapse prevention. She's authored numerous articles and book chapters, and is co-author of Mindfulness-Based Relapse Prevention for Addictive Behaviors, A Clinician's Guide. You can learn more, get this episode's show notes, and join our email list at noblemindpodcast.com. We hope you enjoy the show as much as we did. Hello, everyone. We are here with Dr. Sarah Bowen. Looking forward to chatting a bit today. Why don't we get started by having you tell us about yourself and a little bit about your work, maybe? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm happy to be here. I am a clinical psychologist by training and also um, in the academic world. So I'm an associate professor at Pacific University. And uh, my work has primarily been in studying addictions and applying mindfulness-based approaches, integrating those into more kind of Western um, contexts to treat addictive behaviors. So primarily substance use. More recently, I've been sort of reaching out into different related fields, but my my heart and the heart of my work is still in addictions, substance use. And how did you develop an interest in mindfulness? Did it start with personal experiences? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, I wish this were more linear. I'm going to try and uh, condense this. You know, and I look over my past, I think there's always been sort of whisperings, you know, as a young child, even just kind of a contemplative nature and curiosity about what it means to exist and how to how to be more in contact with what's real and what is reality and those kinds of questions were all kind of bumping around in my head. Um, but I didn't really have a way to think about that or articulate it or study it. And then I went to I was working at University of Washington, actually. I just finished undergrad there and working in a couple labs, thinking about going to graduate school. Came across um, Alan Marlat, who was faculty there at the time. We had a lab that studied addictive behaviors. And at the time, he was doing a really interesting trial on Vipassana meditation in a jail. And I just found that really interesting. I didn't know what Vipassana was. I didn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Just, yeah, not, not part of my um, kind of context in academic life so far. Um, and then I went and chatted with him and just became really interested in, in this work and the, just the idea of applying something like that to a population that usually doesn't have access to those sorts of things. So I started working in his lab and then eventually got into that program there and did my doctoral studies there. And my job as a research assistant was to go give these assessments to people in this jail mm -hmm. uh, before and after they took the Vipassana course. And I certainly noticed a difference in the before and after and became really interested in what was going on in sort of this black box of 10 days of meditation and decided to go sit a retreat for the sole purpose of understanding what was happening so I could write a thesis on it. Uh -huh, okay. so I went into this Vipassana course with you know pencil and paper, 
hiding. It was like clandestine. You weren't allowed to have that. So I sort of experienced that myself. <laughs> okay. So yes, yeah. you, you know well. <laughs> and you also probably won't be surprised that by day two, I realized that this isn't, I can't do it this way. <laughs> you know, I can't sit on the sideline and, um, and study this from outside. I have to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a real struggle as it is for many people. Um, and I was probably the most restless or at least felt that way person in the room and mm-hmm. um, just never really settled into it. And at one point mid, um, this is over the holidays that I did this and right around day five, I, uh, I ran away. <laughs> I just, you know, they, they take your wallet and your, you know, your shoes and you don't have anything and they don't, they, you know, they, they just keep it safe for you. So you don't have to worry about it. But it was pre cell phone days. I didn't have anything. I didn't have idea. I didn't have anything. I just had like slippers and meditation clothes <laughs> and I didn't know where I thought I was going to go, but I had to go. So <laughs> I was on this Island in the Pacific Northwest and I uh, just, wa- just walked out and started walking wow. down the road. Uh, and send a flare and hope they send a helicopter for you. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, it's like, I don't know where I'm going, but I got to go. So mm-hmm. I walked and walked and I saw in the distance a gas station. And it was like the oasis, you know, in the desert and a pay phone. And I called my poor parents because that's the only phone number I could think of and to call collect and called them and hadn't spoken for five days and was sort of laughing, crying, like, I don't know, this is so horrible. This is so interesting. This is so hard. This is so great. And they're like, okay, honey, where are you? Are you okay? So finally I said, yes, I'm okay. I got to go back. I got to do this. So went back and that was my first experience, you know, just kind of deep end. That's great. You know, I, I actually tried to do a Vipassana retreat when I was maybe 22 and I left early. It was just, um, yeah, for a variety of reasons, it's not worth getting into, but probably chief among them being I was 22 and had no idea what I was doing, (laughs) you know, but yeah, those programs are really intense and really hard. They're very intense. And I, you know, kid, I don't think I would have gone back if I hadn't been in my first year in graduate school, knowing that I would have to live that down for the next at least five or six years. That's right. You had to report back and talk about your experience. Yes. Everyone knew I was on retreat. So I stayed and then I, you know, I, I didn't sit for years after that. And then I kind of found my way back in in a more motivated by, by different things and in a, a more compassionate way. And I found a different, you know, sort of went over to the insight meditation group that just was a better fit for me than the Goenka style, at least for, for now, at least in the beginning. And then just, so my, my, that was a very long answer to your question, but my, my first steps into it were through really trying to have a better academic understanding of what this was and how does it work so I can write about it and impress people with my knowledge of mechanisms and whatever. And then, you know, quickly realized that it doesn't work that way. And also became really interested in this pair with just felt so fortunate because my academic study of this work and my own personal journey in meditation were paralleled. And that, that sort of dual journey was very much supported um, in my lab. There was a bunch of meditators. And so you could just take off and you know, go on retreat for a week and you lunch break, we could all sit together and practice together. And so it was very integrated. So was that Ellen Mar- Marlatt's lab? Yes, exactly. For our listeners, the New York Times called him in his obituary, the leading proponent of the harm reduction approach. Yeah, very much so. Very radical in many ways. Just he was a visionary um, and brilliant and unafraid <laughs> <laughs> to uh, go against a lot of the mainstream thinking and feels a lot of criticism and he he just kept going and uh we, we used to call our lab the island of misfit toys because it was sort of <laughs> felt like there was a lot of people who acted right and dressed right and looked right all around us and we always felt sort of like the weird ones who wanted to meditate and also be part of this academic world right had Marla long been interested in mindfulness or did that develop professionally as well over you know as it became more talked about in psychology yeah. No, he really was one of those first brave ones who he wrote a, a beautiful paper in 2002, the theory paper on integration or application of mindfulness to addictive behaviors. Um, it's lovely. I've read it so many times. It's just a sweet, sweet little piece. And that was, I think, his first real kind of higher profile um, article. And that was, you know, 2002. And it was before this was 
accepted and exciting. Um, he was really one of the first, and it was sort of something you did in the basement prior to that, and then <laughs> didn't talk about it unless you had tenure, you know. <laughs> right, um, right, right. He had discovered meditation in his own life, and he writes about it in that article mm. uh, for health reasons, um, blood pressure, I believe it was, and, mm. you know, was skeptical and all that, and then realized, oh, this is actually helpful, and then became really interested in how to, you know, he'd been very much in the addictions world, of course, mm. uh, prior to that. Um, but then became interested in how to integrate mindfulness practice and addictions treatment. I mean, that's interesting because he he started when aversion approaches were being applied to addiction, and then he came up with harm reduction, and then bridged over to mindfulness based treatment. Yeah, yeah, he did. I mean, he really w- was going upstream. <laughs> Definitely, I mean, this, he, the prominent treatment approach was the the AA model, the moral model, um, a very kind of black and white thinking where, you know, if you have one lapse, you fully relapsed and it's a, it's a moral problem and you need to have better willpower. And, you know, here's a treatment for you, but if it doesn't work, it's your fault kind of a model. And so he both was very big in the harm reduction world and, and looking at, you know, these, that model may not work for everyone. And we have to look at different approaches. And also we have to recognize that relapse is part of the process for most people who go to treatment. The vast majority of people who achieve abstinence at some point lapse. And that's, you know, that's not a personal failing. That's part of the process. And he was really one of the first to put that out there and really push ahead and design programs that allowed people to be people and a change process to be a natural change process rather than some sort of um, idea of what it should look like. So with Alan Marlat, you developed the mindfulness-based relapse prevention approach, and now you're the lead person in the world for that. Yeah, it really is. The program that's sort of now formed is a, it's, pulling from the very best approaches, the best parts of the best approaches that we could find. It's sort of a mashup and hopefully more than that, hopefully like a true integration of these different approaches. So there is the standard relapse prevention model, which Alan had, you know, back in the mid eighties had been um, researching and applying and training. And that's a very cognitive behavioral approach, really skills based approach for how to um, maintain substance use treatment gain, you know, gains that were successfully, you know, implemented in treatment and that are very hard to maintain. Uh, so taking that and also motivational interviewing, which is a lovely client centered approach and, you know, all the research has wonderful outcomes and um, bringing those together with mindfulness and with meditation and with a contemplative a way for people to, I feel like what the mindfulness approach brings into it is we're handing over the expert role to the client. So rather than, you know, someone coming to us and saying, I, you know, help me, tell me what to do, tell me how to be, I feel our role is to help people learn for themselves, give people tools so that they can observe their own minds and bodies and behaviors and have a better understanding from direct observation, not from a textbook, not from a lecture, not just from their own, what they're observing. So they learn and they become an expert on their own behaviors and their own minds. And then they can start to work with that and they can make changes where they want to make changes. Because right, when you're dealing with a, an addiction, there's so many people in, you know, likely in a person's life trying to tell them to stop and a lot of finger wagging from professionals and other families. So it's very much this like outer energy coming at you sort of thing. So to sort of reorient that. I think no one knows better than an addict what they're supposed to do. (laughs) You You know exactly what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And they've been told that and they've probably told themselves that they're for years and years and years, and that doesn't that doesn't always work. It seems like stigma, shame, guilt, blame, those things are very very much involved in addiction. Oh yeah, I think mm-hmm. I think we're trying to counter that in this approach. Mm-hmm. I mean, Alan talked about what he called the abstinence violation effect, which is any period in which you're doing great. So let's say you're abstaining for a while, and then you slip. You know, you have a drink or whatever your thing is. And then all these things start to happen. You know, all the, like, I knew I couldn't do it. 
I'm worthless. There's all these thoughts. There's views of self. There's lots of emotions. There may, you know, physiology, all of that stuff comes in and we beat ourselves up and it isn't helpful. That actually we're, we're not helping ourselves. Um, and so how can we, rather than piling on more fear and shame, how can we peel that off and, and maybe have a more compassionate and practical approach? I mean, we, we know that, <laughs> you know, from the research that a sense of self-efficacy is a huge predictor of how people do long-term. Um, and shame doesn't build self-efficacy. You know, self-efficacy is a belief in your own ability to be the person you want to be, you know. And if you, the more belief you have in that, uh, and the more you can support yourself in that, the better you're going to do. And shame isn't usually helpful for most people. <laughs> There's other ways to do it. Even if it is helpful in the short term, it's just so, it's violent, it's destructive. We don't, I don't think we need, I don't think that has to be a part of this. So shame actually contributes, fires up relapse rather than being a positive force. It certainly can. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there who are, you know, are fear based and that's their way through it. And they're so afraid and so ashamed of who they were and so afraid of being that again. And that keeps them vigilant. I'm sure. I mean, whatever works. <laughs> if shame worked, I'd say, okay, let's, let's put a little bit of that in there. And I just don't. I don't think it works. Even even if it does work for one behavior, it's destructive in other ways. Shame doesn't build good things. <laughs> it tears things yeah. down. Yeah, it's reminding me of, um, it's like authoritarianism. Is that what I'm thinking? Like it, it makes you comply in the short run, but it doesn't actually win hearts and minds kind of. I feel like shame is a little bit like that. Like you might, you might comply with that shame-based fear or thinking, but in the long term, it's, it may have other negative side effects or, or unhelpful sort of consequences. I also just think it's inaccurate. I mean, shame is, there's a difference between shame and say regret, you know, and I think regret, okay, yeah, sure. We all regret things we've done. That doesn't mean we are a bad person and our essence is bad and we don't have the right to be who we are. That's just not accurate. We're all doing our best. We're trying really, really hard. And people with addictions histories are trying really, really hard. The slips that happen and the things that happen, there's, there's reasons and there's ways to work with that. And it doesn't mean that the person is bad. You know, it means Absolutely. there's more to learn and there's some changes to make. Mm. But I just don't think shame is, yeah, I don't think it's, it's just not accurate. You say that the urge surfing exercise encapsulates the, the approach. Would you like to say more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, urge surfing is, is just one of my favorite practices. And this, was, this came from a metaphor that Alan Marlott used, I believe, in his uh, 1985 book with Judith Gordon about, um, and it's from a client that he had who was trying to quit smoking and who was a surfer. Um, and they sort of came up with this metaphor together of when these huge urges come up, which, you know, for smoking, they're just overwhelming sometimes. Um, can you kind of ride that out like you're riding a wave and it will pass? So we took that metaphor and just built a, just a whole practice around it. And I feel like this whole program is kind of <laughs> built around it. And essentially the, the practice is to connect with something that's difficult. So, you, I mean, usually, obviously, when something aversive comes up, something challenging, our impulse is to make it go away, to fix it, to feel better. And that's totally understandable. We want to feel good. But oftentimes, of course, the thing that makes that go away is destructive in the long term and doesn't end up actually helping us. So urge surfing is a very real practice. We sit in session and practice being with things that are really difficult, that feel intolerable. And how can we be with those in a way that's not like the, you know, clenching my fists and willpower, white knuckling through it. It's how can I be in contact with something that's really difficult um, in a way that's safe and maybe really challenging, but that's doable? And what happens when I do that? You know, what is, what is the thing? What does it really actually feel like? What is so uncomfortable? What is so scary about this? What does that feel like in my body? What is my mind doing? Can I stay with that and notice it may pass? It may come back again and it may pass again. And then the other piece of it I I really appreciate in that practice is in that time, in that, in that sense, when there's that kind of urge, you know, it often has kind of a tinge of panic to it. 
and just this, this urgency that's very acute. And so there's a, there's a need that's very real. And so part of this practice is being with that huge sense of, you know, reactivity or urge or craving, and then also asking yourself, what do I really need here? Is there something, there is a very strong driving need happening. What is it really that I need? I don't think I actually need that substance, but I need to feel better or I need to, I need safety or I need someone to just validate what I'm, what I'm experiencing right now, whatever it might be for people. But there's often just a, a, a need that needs addressing. That urge is rising up out of something. It's not just sort of a random occurrence. Yes. And that sense of urgency is also, you know, it's like, I need something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Let's, let's see what it really is. What right. The need is. right. Yeah. Instead of thinking, I'm bad for having this urge. Ex- Why do I want to eat ice cream at night? Yes. Like, what's wrong? And that, with that? Right. Another thing I think is so, especially people with histories of addiction and whether it's, yeah, food addiction, substance use, whatever it might be, the craving comes and it's like, you already failed, you know, for a lot of people. <laughs> like, oh, I shouldn't even want this anymore. And now I'm having this, these thoughts about it and my body's doing something and I'm scared, you know, because I want this thing and I shouldn't, it's like, I've already failed and it's going to happen. Here it comes, here it comes. And learning to have a different relationship with that. So yes, there, there is craving and it can be scary. And practicing, really sitting in a room with yourself and practicing being with that and realizing that you can feel it. It's not pleasant, but you can feel it and stay with it. And you don't have to react in that way. You don't have to. You actually do have a choice in how you respond to this. It's physiological. It's conditioning. It's not your fault. It's going to happen. So let's get rid of that whole thing. It's like the shame thing. It's not useful. It's not accurate. You know, the real question is like, okay, I'm experiencing this. And how can I really help myself get through this? And you point out in your work that when we are on autopilot, we're basically acting out our conditioning. And to be able to step out of our conditioning and perhaps recondition ourselves or counter condition or have choice and freedom and agency, we need to be able to surf the urge. Yes. And that, that to me is the whole, that is what mindfulness is, is learning that we are conditioned. Of course we are. Mm-hmm. Being able to see that, because if you don't see it, you're just part of the system and you're just going to bounce around reacting and being a, you know, sort of a, a victim of conditioning, really. Once you see it, like, oh, when this thing happens, my body and mind react like this. And then I behave like this. Very understandable. Again, there's no fault here. There's no, there's no right, wrong. That's just how, how it works. We're animals. This is how it works. How can we see that system and just put a little bit of space in there so we have some agency and some choice so that when the thing happens, I don't just run away from it. You know, the thing happens and I can assess like, oh, is this really a threat? Can I be with this? What do I really need right now? What do I really want right now? What's going to serve me best here? And that can shift just that seeing alone <laughs> can shift it, that we, that we don't have to react to everything that comes our way. But if we're on autopilot, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. And just even having that, having a craving and then feeling like there's some choice there or that you've not already failed, but that you can observe the craving and, and have options for what to do with it or how to explore it in your experience feels like it would be extremely freeing and and helpful in building that sense of agency. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, it's, it is, it's freeing. That's a perfect word. It reminds me a little bit about DBT and their ideas of distress tolerance. And I'm wondering, is there any connection in these approaches or because urge surfing feels so much like the distress tolerance part of DBT? Alan's lab, where I studied, was right next door to Marshall Linehan's lab. (laughs) I mean, there's so much overlap, of course, and there are differences. I think they were both these DBT and the the mindfulness approaches, specifically MBRP, were, were formed with different populations in mind. So I think, you know, the, some of the things we see underlying borderline personality disorder versus addiction, much, a lot of overlap and also some sort of unique targets, treatment targets that are going to be a little bit different. So I think like with, with DBT, the, the format 
that mindfulness practices tend to be in is very different than in MBRP. And that's appropriate for the population and what people are, are experiencing and struggling with. So in that sense, they're different in a very topographical sense. They're different. They look different. I think functionally, Marshall Linehan was a behaviorist through and through. I am a behaviorist through and through. And so those principles are definitely shared. I wouldn't say distress tolerance. I would say let's change our relationship altogether. Let's actually sit in the middle of it and feel it and let it be there and flow through us rather than embodying it and having it control us. Yeah, they're very much the same and very different. <laughs> I think that the similarities really are, the, the foundation is the same, it's, it's behaviorism. It really is, it's um, learning how to kind of reshift how we're relating to things inside us and outside of us. You know, we have the power to do that and the way that we go about doing that is a little bit different in the two approaches, but the, the system of kind of the, the mechanisms underneath and the way that we're seeing behavior and trying to affect behavior, I would say is very similar. This is not about addiction and don't drink again. It's not about a specific behavior. That's one example of being human and the human struggle. And this approach, and it's so interesting when we do this training with clinicians, we go through the course ourselves and then we start seeing how to apply it. But the learning is very much first person experiential self as laboratory. We're going to do this and get it from the inside out and then share it in a way that makes sense to you. And so when clinicians go through this, and this happens in, in, in client groups too, there's, there's <laughs> typically a point where it's like, oh, this is, a, this is about a lot more than just substance use and addiction, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah it really is. It's, about, it's, it's all encompassed in everything. It's, this is one way that for certain people, reactivity and behavior and self-medicating manifests. Um, and for other people, it's different. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's violence. Maybe it's just self-hatred, maybe whatever it is. And it's, it's, it's kind of shifting from the symptom reduction sort of way of, of approaching uh, treatment to really looking at the function of these behaviors and, and how they're serving and not serving us. And so the behavior almost is secondary. It's more how, how can we um, be on our own side and help ourselves out. And In fact, you don't set goals for number of drinks and so on. That's irrelevant. Yeah, it, it kind of is. And I think, you know, it, this was also initially developed as an aftercare treatment. I think that's important because those number of drinks and those kind of skills and drink refusal and, you know, get the alcohol out of your house and change your social circles and that kind of stuff is really helpful for a lot of people. Um, so we're not saying that that is not critical. That is really helpful in the initial stages, especially. It's like we got to kind of pull you out of the context because otherwise you're just going to slip right back in. Um, and so let's shift the context and sort of the, the blocking around you, literally maybe even pull you out of that and put you in a treatment center and uh, make those changes because it's so hard to change behavior. It's so hard. So you might need that radical shift first. Then there's the rest of your life. You know, it's like, okay, now the dust is settling that, you know, I've detoxed, <laughs> I've kind of put things in place, um, dealing with the legal stuff, the family stuff, the financial stuff, all that is kind of settling down a little bit. And then you're kind of looking at the rest of your life. And for many people there, you know, this has been their coping mechanism. This mm -hmm. is their go-to. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what they know how to do. And in some ways it, it is really effective. So it's sort of more at that stage, I think, where this program or this kind of approach is, is really useful. Mm, that's really helpful distinction. Yeah. yeah. Like the now what phase. <laughs> like, right, yeah. right, right. So, yeah, right. So it's a mindfulness-based relapse prevention. So that suggests you've achieved something in terms of feeling like you've, you're maintaining some amount of sobriety or whatever, and, and then you want to maintain that and not lapse or relapse. Sure. I mean, imagine someone whose best friend has been alcohol for years and years and years, and then you successfully take the alcohol away. Right you know, okay, then what? Like, there's more to it. <laughs> That's a critical first step. There's a lot more to look at because that, whatever that behavior is, has been serving a real function in that person's yeah. life. So. Well, maybe this would be a good time to bring it into the sort of, because as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, so much of this, as you're saying, is just not just about 
addiction, you know, or substance use disorder. So much of this is about behavior change and, you know, managing in difficult or problematic behaviors. And I know many of us over the course of this pandemic have fallen into certain habits that are maybe not so helpful that we might be feeling sort of stuck in, whether it's overeating or over drinking. Wondering if you have any thoughts for those of us in this time who are dealing with problematic, you know, behaviors that either started or maybe relapsed over this time? Well, first of all, yes. I mean, of course. <laughs> I think how could it be otherwise is sort of my first thought is like, right, of course. Right, right, so yeah. I think, you know, the first step is to just maybe say that to ourselves. It's like, of course, this is really, really difficult and unprecedented. And it's hard enough day-to-day -day life to be a person. It's difficult and it difficult to greater and lesser extents and in different ways, but it's just hard being human. It's hard and nobody really knows how to do it. And we're all, we're trying our best and we're trying to feel better. We're trying to figure it out. We're, we're trying to suffer less. We're trying to figure out what happiness is and go get it. We're all of those things. And also in the context of society giving us crazy messages, mm -hmm. family giving us crazy messages, mm -hmm. um, and then throw a global pandemic in there and lock <laughs> in houses. Right, right, <laughs> right. Like, Good Lord, this is hard. So I think the first thing maybe is to just have some compassion and, and just yeah, say, yeah, it's hard to be human. It's hard to be this particular human in this particular time. And I'm doing my best, you know, I think that's, so that we're not starting with a sort of let's beat this out of ourselves and, you know, have more willpower and just be a little bit harder on ourselves and the kind of tough love that sometimes isn't really love at all. It's just tough. And I don't, again, I don't know that that's very effective and it just, it's just mean. It just, we don't have to be mean to ourselves. So I think that's the first thing. And then I think another thing is, this is something we work on a lot in MBRP is looking at what it is we're really wanting when we reach for X, whatever it is, whether it's food or more TV or alcohol or whatever it might be. Again, there's a need there. And just like, what is, what is it I want? Oh, I want some comfort because this is really difficult or I just want to go to sleep or I just want to take my mind off of things and feel good for a minute or whatever it is. And taking a moment to realize that, you know, like, yeah, this is, this isn't me being bad. This is me having a need and I'm just trying to meet my need. And this thing is what's in front of me, you know, and maybe it's not perfect, but it's, it's again, coming back to Alex, what you were saying is it's the craving isn't bad. It's us trying to take care of ourselves. Just the thing we're reaching for doesn't always give us what we really want. <laughs> it's sort of false advertising, you know? I'm also thinking, yeah, during the pandemic that so many of our usual ways of meeting our needs have been taken away or changed, like the whole, all of our patterns and routines have just been thrown up in the air. And, and wow. so it would make sense that people would have needs that maybe used to be getting fulfilled or, you know, things had been, things were stabilized before. And now it's like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to meet this need. And so you just start ending up like, like you're saying, what's in the house? Well, there's alcohol in the house. There's food in the house, whatever, you know, yeah. so um, that's available right now. Yeah. I think, you know, when, when you would think of, as a behaviorist, like it was pounded into me and now it's, it's in me. It, thinking about this in terms of what we don't do well when we don't have positive reinforcement in our lives, things that are just naturally nourishing, you know, things that you come in contact with that feel like they, they feed you in a very wholesome way. So maybe it's nature, maybe it's human interaction, maybe it's work, just being involved in a team and doing things and having that kind of excitement. Um, maybe it's just going to concerts, whatever it is, all those things that even when they're challenging, you know, sometimes they, they really do feed us they make us more of who we are and who we want to be. And then you kind of shifting to this maybe more negative reinforcement model, which is sort of trying to feel better and trying not to feel so bad. You know, it's like trying to just get back to baseline. It's like, I just need something to just, because I don't have all these positive reinforcers, all this nourishment that I you know, we're used to having in our typical lives. Now we're just trying to feel less bad. And so that's oftentimes when these behaviors become problematic. It's like, I just want to feel a little less crappy. So I'm going to have another glass of wine, or I just don't want to think about all the stuff I'm thinking about. So I'm just going to watch Netflix for the rest of the day or whatever it is. And towards the end of the program, you 
teach people or you get people to think about how to have a fuller, a more whole life so that it's nourishing for them. Yeah, that's a, and I think this is a mindfulness comes in here in terms of finding ways to connect with what we already have. And this is oof, during a pandemic, especially, I mean, always, but when, when things are really limited in a very real way, we don't have these big hits of pleasure and joy and fun. How can we sensitize ourselves so that we get some nourishment from what we do have? So in other words, like there's, you know, in Buddhism, they talk about things that are like either great or bad or sort of neutral, right? And we tend to like crave the good and push away the bad and ignore the neutral. <laughs> nothing's neutral, nothing's good, nothing's bad. It's our perception of it. So there's a way that mindfulness practice can help us, first of all, sort of shift our behaviors around great and not sort of like the good and the bad, but also the neutral becomes maybe not neutral. So like, for example, you know, I let my dog out in the morning to go to the bathroom. It's like, it's a thing, whatever. I ignore it. I'm thinking about it and other things. It's not, it's not an event in my life. When I bring attention to it and, you know, watch the way that she walks and the, her funny little back leg is a little crooked and, you know, it's just, it's, it, there's something, there's something to it. Yeah. When I show up for it, it's, it's amazing. There's this animal that I live with who's a different species who, you know, <laughs> is so charming and it becomes something. It's not neutral. It's not gray. You know, it sort of comes into, into full color. So I think that's another thing that's been really helpful for, for me in, in the pandemic, especially is, just looking around and seeing things that I would typically ignore and because my head is elsewhere, but like sunlight coming through the window or a first sip of coffee in the morning or how, you know, soft and cozy my socks are on a cold day, <laughs> whatever it might be that aren't important enough to hold our attention or to even get our attention. Yeah. Let me see if I can distill that down. Cause I think there's a, some, like just a really great point there. So pandemic, loss of reinforcement, <laughs> loss of reinforcers, you know, the positive reinforcers that sort of keep us going and feeling good. And then mindfulness can help us become more aware of those neutral things in our everyday world that can then start to feel more positive because we're paying attention to them. And, in, you know, inevitably, when we pay attention to our pets, let's say, <laughs> we're going to have a hit of, oh, my God, that's so cute, or how, how sweet, or how, you know, whatever. So that's going to become a positive a reinforcer or like you say mm -hmm. becoming sensitized to the cozy socks or the sunshine that you sure. can you can sensitize yourself to appreciate those smaller things that, to be positive reinforcers yeah exactly and i think you know when we're caught up in our heads we we just don't we miss all that and i think another way that this practice during the pandemic is there is a lot of real there is a lot of suffering our own and all around us it's just immeasurable and to be able to be with that is challenging and there are different ways of being with it and you know you try and avoid it and kind of self-medicate and it just that takes its toll after a while and if we can learn to acknowledge how hard this is and the sadness and the fear and all of that in whatever way it doesn't you know it might just be little touches of it to be with that and acknowledge this is really hard and have some just some softness and some compassion around that there's a there's a, such a different quality yeah. You know, when you kind of drop into that space, it's just, it's soft and loving and sustainable mm -hmm. and kind rather than ranting and raving and fear and anger, you know, all of that stuff too. And of course we go in and out of all of these things, but just mm -hmm. even little drops of that, I think throughout the day can be really helpful and mm -hmm. make this just a little more possible, <laughs> less, mm -hmm. maybe less destructive on, on our beings. So it seems mindfulness and compassion are also an acceptance, mm -hmm. also part of the model. Oh, yeah. I think those all go together, right? I do. I think if, you're, if you realize that we're, you're, we're doing our best, we're human, this is part of being human. It's not, it's not that you're screwing this up. <laughs> it's that right. we're, we're all flopping around trying to figure this out. <laughs> How can you not have compassion? I mean, it just makes sense. It's like, I am doing my best. <laughs> this is really hard. And I keep falling down and then there's shame and that's hard. And it's all hard. And it's lovely. I mean, it's everything. And that's all being human. And so compassion is just part of that. It's just understanding and accepting that this is how it is. Not always what I would have chosen, but this is how it is. So I'm, I need to accept that. Can't change it. And 
you know, this is, it's difficult and can I be kind? Are you familiar with Gabor Mate's ideas? I mean, I've, I've heard him say things like, the question isn't why are so many people addicted, but why do so many people need drugs, let's say, or that, that it seems to address this point that people are living unsatisfying lives and disconnected lives. Yeah, and that, I, I think that's lovely. Again, it, it takes the blame and shame away from an individual. I'm like, you know what? You're really screwing this life up. You know, you need to, you need to do better. And instead, it's, you know, we, we all exist in a context and in a system and we're human and we react to things and that's not our fault. This is how it is. Can we look at that and understand that um, and take this whole finger pointing and blame shame off of it and instead say, yeah, this is, it's amazing that we are doing as well as we are. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah, given what everyone experiences mm-hmm. in a day and given the, yeah. you know, the range of emotions and the difficulty and the lack of kind of education around how to do that and how to be with that and what the world is telling us we should be that we'll never be able to be and never be good enough. And like, it's, it's amazing that we, <laughs> Gosh, when you say it that way, I'm like, it is amazing that I survived my day yeah. <laughs> at all intact. <laughs> There's so much. And it's an unwinnable game. You look at people who have quote unquote won and you're like, what? You know, that's not, when do you land? When do you ever get there? That's when do you right, make it? Right, right, <laughs> yeah, right. I think about those studies with the lottery winners who end up like tanking and falling apart or ne- not feeling any happier, at, you know, at best, <laughs> you know. And yeah. all the celebrities, you know, who we just revere in this society and you hear their stories and you start to look inside their lives and it's just tragic and fear-based for so many. And there's, ugh, and yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> And I think that's one of the things I love about when we're able to do this kind of work in groups is the personal stories fall away very quickly. We don't spend much time on personal stories, you know, where, when did you first start using, where did your family fell apart, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's more, it's what is it like to be you from the inside out? So it's really not the story, it's the, the direct experience. And, and you just start to see in the room as people are sharing that we're all, we're, oh, <laughs> this is, oh, you too, me too. Your mind, yeah, oh, yep, yeah, me too. This is what our minds do. This is how it is to be human. And valuing one's internal experience is a, and validating it is a big part of it, as opposed to saying I'm bad for, there's something wrong with me for having this need. I, I'm curious how you define addic- addiction and addictive behaviors. I can't believe no one's ever asked me this. That's a really good question. I would say addiction is when you get caught in this cycle of negative reinforcement. So in other words, like initially, oftentimes it's positively reinforcing. You know, if you think about someone who they go to a party, they drink, they're with their friends, it's fun. The consequences aren't horrible. Maybe they have a hangover, but it's still fun. They're still getting something sort of, you know, quote unquote positive from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, for some people can just become a way to feel normal and not feel so horrible. And so they keep kind of going to this thing because they feel really bad and they feel a tiny bit less bad when they engage in this behavior. But then after that behavior, there's consequences and there's that abstinence violation effect and there's physiological consequences. There's, you know, collateral damage in their lives I would say addiction is a, it's a behavioral cycle that we get stuck in that does not serve us well, that ends up being more harmful, but is very difficult to shift out of because there is that initial hit that makes me feel a little less bad. You know, it just, it helps, it helps kind of lessen the suffering for a moment, or it helps kind of numb out some of the, whatever it is you don't want to feel. So some kind of short-term relief, but then increasingly negative consequences, and then you can't stop in spite of that. Yeah, and that's, again, not our fault. That's conditioning. Right. We are all products of conditioning, and that is straight up Skinnerian conditioning. <laughs> you know, right, that's not right. our fault. That's right. Psych 101 kind of. <laughs> wow. yeah. So getting caught up in a loop of suffering. Yes. You know, suffering and then trying so hard to alleviate our suffering. Again, we're trying to feel better. When you're engaging in, let's say, it's substance use, you just want to feel better. 
you want to feel less bad or you want to feel happy or you want to just go to sleep or you want to numb out or you want to have more energy, whatever it is, we're trying to take care of ourselves. We are trying to feel better. It's not working. The thing we're going to is not going to serve us. Do you see a link between adverse childhood experiences and trauma? Like a very strong link between that and addictions or is it just one of the streams that feed the river? Wow. Uh, Yes and yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely. And you see it in the literature. I mean, there's, there's a huge comorbidity between trauma and addiction. And it certainly makes sense. The effects of trauma, both historical and childhood trauma and kind of current, you know, ongoing trauma um, are, are so real. And oftentimes people are not given the kind of support and resources that they really, really need you know, people, you, you need help. And the consequences of trauma are huge and real and pervasive. And it might really help feel a little less whatever to have some of whatever, you know, and it's like you're self-medicating. That's, that's, and of course, of course, again, it's really understandable. I um, mean, also with trauma, there's oftentimes a lot of shame, sometimes secrecy, and uh, so that sort of sense, too, of lack of self-worth, uh, lack of belief that I could actually be different, all those kinds of things feeds into it, too. And it just becomes a big, again, a big cycle. And we're working on a couple different studies right now with populations who have both PTSD or severe trauma histories, anyway, or symptoms and, and addiction. And really looking at that is not like, oh, we're treating two different things at the same time, but like looking at the underlying like bi-directional nature of this relationship between trauma and addiction, you know, and how addiction also oftentimes when people are involved in substance use, their trauma symptoms go untreated because they're they're being sort of doused and numbed, medicated. And so they don't they don't arise in a way that they can really be dealt with. And, and people end up getting tracked into the addiction treatment programs and addiction, you know, which is can feel a little siloed sometimes, like in, in the sort of mental health system, you know, and not all of those programs seem to really bring in that trauma informed lens or understanding. Exactly. And that I think I think that's shifting. I mean, I'm in a very specific little, you know, bubble, but several things are working. I can think of three trials off the top of my head that are saying, no, we need to treat these together. They are. Yeah hand in hand, they are so, you know, integral to each other and they feed each other and you've got to approach it yeah, as one organism. It's not two separate things to be treated in two separate clinics. Yeah, I'm thinking even the way that abnormal psych is maybe taught is sort of very much siloing, you know, instead of thinking, you know, well, the more transdiagnostic approaches are becoming more broadly taught and understood, but there is still that tendency, even just because, well, that's how the book's organized. So let's just go section by section, you know, so the, uh, the uncreative sort of pedagogy is just, you know, chapter one, this kind of disorder, chapter two, this one, and then you lose that, you lose that sense of an integrated human being. Yeah, I hope that shifts in our field. I really do. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be going that direction, but to do a more functional approach of how these things all are related or many of them are related. I mean, just look at the comorbidities and it's like, okay, yeah, these are not separate things. <laughs> right, 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 right. I think these yes. are somehow related. Well, I know, you know, many of our listeners, I imagine, because this is broadly true in the general public, if they themselves aren't dealing with any kind of addiction, they have loved ones who are, family members who are presently or in the past or will. Just wonder if you have any thoughts for those who love and care for people dealing with addictions and, um, you know, any insights about being supportive and helpful in... My first thought is, again, it's, it's so challenging for the person, of course, with the addiction and also for friends and family and you know, it can be such a huge range of emotions, sometimes all happening at once of, you know, anger, frustration, shame, love, fear, all of it. It's really hard to, to watch someone going through that. And um, oftentimes it's hard to deal with your own feelings, watching someone like you don't want to be angry and disappointed. You want to be loving, but get it together. Stop it. Why can't you just be different? You know, I can't go through this again. I don't want to be around you when you're using. I hate you when you're using all those things. It's it's really hard. So I think it's again recognizing that is, you know, yeah, it's it's incredibly challenging. And 
both sides need support. There's not one thing that works for everyone ever. So, you know, finding help and finding what works. And if it's AA, great. If it's something other than AA, great. If it's both together, great. Um, if it's inpatient, if it's outpatient, and then, you know, that's why there's also groups for, for families of people with addictions and partners and kids and all that, because it affects, it really does affect everyone hugely. And your world can start to center around that. And so the whole system needs help, not just the person. Yeah. Could you also tell us a little bit about the research findings and rather impressive results of MBRP in clinical trials? Yeah. Um, there's been a number of trials now, which is really exciting. The largest trial to date, um, this was published back in 2014, we were interested in looking at standard community-based treatment. This is, you know, oftentimes like psychoeducation, 12-step kind of thing, things you find in community treatment. And comparing that with standard relapse prevention, cognitive behavioral approach, and then the mindfulness-based relapse prevention. So we had people who were uh, randomly assigned to one of these three conditions out in the community-based clinics. Um, they went through the treatment, and then we followed them for a year afterwards. The, you know, data is always, there's always caveats and <laughs> you can't ever just say one thing. But if I, one overall sort of finding that was really interesting was right out of the gate, um, right after the eight week treatment period, the folks in relapse prevention and mindfulness based relapse prevention had better outcomes than the people who were in the community based um, treatment. Everybody, first, first, so back up and say everybody was doing better. So the treatment was for, helpful for overall. So the treatment as usual, kind of community-based, they were doing better, but then in yes. the mindfulness-based relapse prevention, relapse prevention, they were doing a bit more better a little yes. afterwards. Yes, <laughs> a bit more better, yes. <laughs> and then uh, at six months, we saw the, kind of the same thing. We saw that people in the relapse prevention and mindfulness group were doing a bit more better <laughs> than the folks in the treatment as usual. Then what was interesting between the six month and the 12 month, and this is, you know, relapse happens in the first year. I mean, oftentimes it happens in the first three months or so, but that first year is, is critical. And what we saw is between the six month and the 12 month period, that is when the relapse prevention and the mindfulness relapse prevention really started being differentiated in terms of outcomes. So we saw that folks in the mindfulness groups were sustaining abstinence for longer periods of time. And also when they did use, they were using less. So whether they just kind of got back on board sooner or whether they were using, but using far less, their use was less. Again, you know, it's much more nuanced than that, but that's sort of overall. And what I think is really interesting about this, and we don't really know why, but my thoughts on this, my guess on this is that the relapse prevention approach is very helpful for very specific contexts and challenges that come up and triggers. So what do you do when someone wants to, you know, who you used to drink with calls you up and you want to go, okay, let's practice that interaction. How's that going to go? Okay, what do you do when you pass by your dealer on the street? How do you, you know, really, really useful things. Sometimes a year out, number one, you haven't been able to practice those because maybe they're pretty low, you know, base rate. So they, they, you don't get a lot of practice with these or maybe your situation has changed. You know, and now you're actually, you moved and now you're getting a divorce and you're dealing with a whole other kind of set of circumstances that you haven't been able to practice. And the mindfulness approach, what we're trying to do is, is work more with our internal reactions to anything that happens in the environment. So whether it's my dealer knocking on my door or a divorce or a fight or job stress or whatever it is. It's not that that I'm learning to cope with. It's my internal reaction to that that I'm learning to cope with. And so that, in theory anyway, generalizes to anything. It's like situation X, situation Y, whatever. What I've learned to work with is what's happening inside of me in that situation. And I get to practice that every single day because something happens every single day. <laughs> Um, it's a constant, it's a skill that just in a, a way of shifting perspective and a relationship to yourself in your life that you get to practice daily. And so it, um, in theory, can just become more reliable and strengthen. 
just also shows the importance of long-term follow-up in these studies too. You know, mm-hmm. when all you do is get the outcome, you know, on the last day of treatment, you miss potentially so much effect in the long run. Right. And especially, you know, for, well, for everything, but I mean, addiction, it's a lifelong process. So. Thank you, Sarah. I'm really uh, impressed and eager to hear more about some of the studies you have going on now <laughs> and what will come of them. For people who are, who are interested in all the nuance and, and shades of gray of your research and findings, we'll maybe put some links to some of your articles on the show notes page and, and send them to your research website as well. So as we move to wrapping up here, I'm wondering if you want to let people know anything about where they can engage with you, your ideas, your work, your research, whether they're clinicians or, or potentially people who think this approach might help them or a loved one. Yeah, sure. There's a website, which my much younger graduate students have told me is very clunky and outdated, but it has <laughs> all the resources. <laughs> it works. <laughs> uh, it's mindfulrp.com. And it has um, it lists trainings that we offer for clinicians. It has some audio files, resources for clinicians to connect with other folks or to find trainings also for clients to find clinicians who have been trained in this that might be in their area. Um, it has information on the research studies, just little sort of synopses of the main findings of the research studies, a little bit of information on who, who we are, the, the mindfulness-based relapse prevention sort of core team of, of trainers and clinicians. And, your, and the second edition of your book has just come out on Guilford. Yes, yes. Thank you, Alex. We're, um, the, we wrote the first edition over 10 years ago now, and we've learned a lot. And there's been a lot of research and a lot of people adapting this to different formats and cultures and contexts and just lovely work that people out there are doing. So that's, uh, that is included in the second edition. We're pretty excited about that. Excellent. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's been a great conversation. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing in the world. And thanks for stopping by and talking to us today. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good to meet you. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review, and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list. You'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.